So here I am, I'm in the Department of Applied Math at the University of Waterloo and I've been asked to teach you guys what I know about quantum mechanics in three weeks or less, I guess three weeks exactly. Um, so one thing that I don't know is, um, well my understanding rather is that you all have different backgrounds in quantum mechanics. So uh, I guess the, um, it's up to you to take the initiative to ask lots of questions, tell me if I say something that's unfamiliar to you, and depending on uh, the rest of the class, we'll either cover it or leave it for the tutorial, or we can discuss it after class. By the way, I have an office here at Perimeter. Which is 423. And I guess I'll generally be around. Um, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, I teach at the university around the noon hour. So I won't be here then, but other than that, I should be around. But generally by appointment, you can meet with me. My email, I think, is on the handout, but I'll just repeat it here for completeness. So by a show of hands, how many of you have had one semester of quantum mechanics so far? And how many of you have had two semesters of quantum mechanics? How many of you had three semesters of quantum mechanics? Oh, very nice. How many of you had zero semesters of quantum mechanics? Okay, good. So you're all familiar probably with wave mechanics and other aspects of the theory. What I'd like to do uh, for this course is um, is uh, you see the outline of topics. If there's anything you'd like added, just send me an email and we'll see what we can do about it. Uh, there may be time for additional topics. Uh, but what I'd like to do is just kind of launch right into the formal axioms of quantum mechanics and then we'll, um, we'll go from there. I, I was originally planning some motivation as well. Uh, you guys want motivation? All right, I'll motivate it. <laughs> um, let me just grab those notes. So, okay. Historically, you've probably all heard about various things like the ultraviolet catastrophe and other issues from the turn of the previous century, which led the scientists of the day to realize that there was something missing in our understanding of nature using only classical mechanics and electromagnetism. So historically, there were a few major, um, major cataclysms. One was the ultraviolet catastrophe. Am I writing large enough for those of you in the back? Okay, So the ultraviolet catastrophe was the fact that if we tried to understand the thermal radiation emitted from a heated box with a small hole in it, uh, it didn't match the prediction of the classical theory. Uh, the resolution of this was to realize that the, the allowed energy levels were discrete or quantized. And this was um, Planck's realization and it allowed him to correctly predict the distribution of electromagnetic radiation that was emitted from this uh, cavity. But this was essentially an ad hoc, this essentially, so basically an ad, this was basically an ad hoc an ad hoc approach to getting the right answer. There was no kind of theoretical reason for doing this. But it worked and suggested there was some deeper, deeper, deeper phenomena, deeper physics at play. Um, another major, major insight came from the photoelectric effect. Let me 
this was Einstein. This was Planck. So how many of you remember the photoelectric effect? About half? Okay, so um, basically I'm just kind of giving you in broad strokes the, the ideas here. The, um, in the photoelectric effect, the idea was you would shine uh, light on a plate and you would ionize the plate and an electron would get emitted. And what was realized was that the, um, that for a given frequency, a minimum amount of energy was required in order to, a threshold in order to ionize the, um, for, to ionize the electron, um, one of the electrons off of the plate. And so to, to Einstein realized one could account for the experimental data um, by assuming that one had a quantization of energy given by E equals NH nu, where H is the Planck constant, which Planck introduced to explain the quantization. So it was essentially a free parameter of the theory of, of Planck's ad hoc, I don't know if I should call it a theory, but Planck's ad hoc explanation of the, photo, of the ultraviolet catastrophe or the correct distribution of, um, of the spectrum of emitted radiation required a, a constant called Planck's constant. And Einstein found that the same proportionality constant was relevant here, where here nu is the frequency of the incident light And um, H equals Planck's constant. And N is an integer. So this should be contrasted with the um, classical setting. So if I have, in the classical theory of electromagnetism, um, so I'm not going to go into the details of the experiment, but the point is that the fundamental insight that was required to explain the experiment was that one had this relationship between the energy of the light and the frequency of the light. And classically what would happen is you could have arbitrarily small amounts of energy. So the idea is you have some light source. You imagine you could just tune the intensity down to be as, as low as you wanted. And that was a prediction of the theory. But what one discovered at the photoelectric effect was that um, to account for the phenomena observed in the photoelectric effect, one needed to assume that given the frequency of the light, the amount of energy that light could deposit into some material in order to ionize an electron could only come in these integer multiples of this unit H nu, which is basically a quantum. In fact, if memory serves me, I think it was Einstein who introduced the word quantum specifically in this context, meaning small packet. And another feature that kind of forced physicists to realize that there was some, some very deep changes were needed to the foundations of physics uh, was the instability of Rutherford's model of the atom. So as you may recall, Rutherford, working at the, around the turn of the century at my alma mater, which is McGill, um, was shooting alpha particles at thin films of gold and looking at the distribution of, of uh, scattering angle of these alpha particles. Alpha particles are ions that have two protons and two uh, neutrons. So they're pretty heavy particles, and then one, you would shoot them through this film, this thin film of gold, actually, and then what would happen is they would sometimes scatter, and sometimes they would, wouldn't scatter, and other times they'd scatter less, and one could experimentally measure the distribution of scattering angles. And in fact, I think Rutherford had his, these were very painstaking experiments in a dark room with a very slow alpha source, and I think it was some cabal of his graduate students that ended up having to... Uh, just sit in this dark room for hours and actually look where the flashes of light occurred and take note of it and collect the statistics from that. And so with that 
from those, from that data, there was kind of this re realization that the only way to account for this data was that atoms weren't this plum pudding, which consists of some, you know, you imagine some atomic radius, and they would be all filled with some molasses of, elect of positive and negative charges. Instead, the realization was that there was a hard nuclear core, and then essentially lots of empty space in which one had an electron somehow orbiting this, this, this nuclear core. So this was the, the nuclear model of Rutherford. And the problem is that due to, um, I think, uh, Brem Strahlung of the electron, one classically would expect if one had an, an, a charged particle orbiting a nuclear core, one would expect it to lose energy and slowly decay into the nucleus. And the, this model that Rutherford came up with to explain his data was inconsistent, wasn't even possible from the laws of classical physics, of classical electromagnetism in particular. And so this suggested that um, you know, there was another kind of incompatibility between theory and experiment. So this is just a few of the kind of famous um, experiments that pointed the way that some new physics was needed. Um, let me just say that you know, I'm not going into depth uh, in these topics, but um, these are covered by most introductory textbooks on quantum mechanics, which bring me to the subject of textbooks. So my notes will be essentially complete, or self-consistent at least. And um, in addition, you probably want some, if you're serious about graduate studies in theoretical physics, you probably want at least one, if not more, textbooks on quantum mechanics. So I have a list of my recommended favorites, which I will pass along to you. Um, I'll just write up that list and uh, all of those textbooks cover these topics, and you could read about it at your, le at your leisure. So then what happened is, in light of these data, and um, Bohr eventually came up with a, one had, there's Bohr's model of the atom, which was an intermediate step. And there are various uh, theoretical steps forward in formulating a theory which could account for all these experiments. And finally, by the, by the 1920s and 1930s, various scientists had essentially formulated a, an axiomatic version of quantum theory which gave a consistent theoretical framework within which one can analyze all of these experiments and which made many, many new predictions. So names like Schrodinger, Heisenberg, Dirac, and in particular, I guess Dirac played less of a role then and more in the relativistic version. Um, really, one of the people that first kind of took a somewhat mathematically rigorous point of view and wrote down axioms for quantum theory was von Neumann. So this was basically, you know, there are many people involved, but these are all familiar names to you, Schrodinger, Heisenberg. Um, born, and less well known is von Neumann. Who took more of a mathematically rigorous approach. So I think, I think it was something around 1932 or 33 where von Neumann published a book which laid out the first um, the first kind of you know, uh, careful axiomatization of quantum theory. Uh, this book didn't become available in English until the 50s, so that's why it's probably less well known. So 
So going forward to the present day, I mean, here we're talking about a theory that was formulated some 80 years ago. Um, why is it still relevant? Well, first of all, it's quantum theory has been enormously successful as a, as a predictive theory. So um, not only did it explain kind of previously inexplicable phenomena, but it made um, extremely precise and um, counterintuitive and unexpected predictions about the behavior of matter, of atoms, and, um, uh, and light. So um, now quantum theory presently, which I'll just abbreviate, um, is believed to be the fundamental theory underlying nuclear atomic um, and chemical systems as well as optics and condensed matter physics. So it's the fundamental theory that underlies this vast spectrum of, of modern theoretical physics. And um, it has made some of the most precise predictions um, in the history of humanity and its ability to predict, for example, the fine structure of hydrogen and, and various effects like that. So um, this is probably all things you know. And the question is kind of, I mean, should you just learn this for historical reasons? or not, and well, the point is there's much, many, many more reasons to learn quantum theory. Um, so here's my, my list of, uh, my list of reasons why one studies quantum theory from a fundamental point of view, rather say than an applications point of view. Okay, so before I give you my list, I'd like to hear your list. So what are your interests in, other than the obvious practical applications of quantum theory, um, fundamental questions that we need to understand for which an understanding of quantum theory is crucial? Nobody? Yes? So arguing about interpretations? Um, uh, let me see, am I going to include that in my list? <laughs> um, yeah, okay, that'll come up, but I'd like to do that last. All right. Any other reasons? Um, Okay, well this, okay, the first reason I'm gonna give kind of spans practicality and, and fundamental uh, reasons. But um, one of the things that's remarkable to me is that we have this axiomatic formulation of quantum theory from the 30s and the fact that um, very important consequences of quantum theory were not discovered until much later. And in my view, and let me give examples of those. So superconductivity, which was, I think, first realized, maybe experimentally, and then theoretically explained. Um, and uh, uh, quantum information, the fact that quantum mechanics allows us to solve problems more efficiently than, than the classical theory, are, are two examples of uh, uh, lasing is a third example, 
discovered much later, I think in the 50s. Uh, so what, what, what that tells me is that these very fundamental uh, properties of, of matter that result from an understanding of quantum theory weren't immediately obvious. So the idea is that quantum mechanics is a sufficiently complex and rich theory that it contains um, very rich and exotic behaviors of matter that are very relevant to us societally. And the fact that it takes so long to go from the axiomatization of the theory to the realization that these quantum theory admits these phenomena is, tells me that we need deeper insights into what quantum theory is telling us about the world, that we can kind of better intuit uh, future developments in terms of applications of quantum theory. Kira? So it could be, we're, right. So that's another, um, I mean, I don't know if that fits into my paradigm. In the, the paradigm I'm trying to draw here is one where phenomena that you wouldn't otherwise suspect existed without quantum theory, right? So, you know, superconductivity, who's going to guess that that's possible? And, but, you know, quantum theory produces that. Um, so, um, so I guess how am I going to state this? So the, the idea is that, um, We need insight into um, quantum theory in order to predict, or better yet, anticipate the kinds of unique phenomena that quantum theory provides provides us. So for example, lasing, superconductivity, um, and quantum computing. I'm sure there's more that one could add to this list. Anyone else have any suggestions? So then the question is, so the question, the question then is, what else? What else are we missing that's, that's going to be very important that we just haven't recognized yet that quantum theory enables? So for me, that's an important reason for understanding the theory fundamentally. I guess I don't have to erase. That's the point, right? Did I put a 1 or an A there? <laughs> I guess that's a, that's a 1. Okay, two. Why else do you need to understand quantum mechanics fundamentally? Tell me about your problems. What are the open problems of science? What's motivating you to come to graduate school in, in physics? Come on, this is easy. You're at Perimeter Institute. What's the biggest unsolved problem of theoretical physics? I'm sorry? Yes, unifying quantum mechanics with gravity. Um, just a quick question. Is my cursive handwriting legible? I kind of go in between the two styles, so. Um, right, so this is a problem people worked on for many decades, and there are tentative solutions, but really no, no consensus about the right way to go about this problem. Um, this is important. I remember when I was undergrad, I was wondering, well, you know, who cares? Why do we really need to unify quantum theory and gravity? Why is that important? I mean, we just have these two theories, they're great. Well, the, the one reason is because, of course, theoretical elegance, and that's the obvious one. 
The other is that uh, there are phenomena for which both gravity and quantum theory are relevant, where there's an interplay, such as the evaporation of black holes. And uh, without a consistent framework for both theories, one can't understand the physics at play there. One can only make kind of ad hoc assumptions and guesses. So this is a major motivation for understanding quantum theory from a fundamental point of view. A third reason for understanding quantum mechanics from a fundamental point of view is, as you will see shortly, I'm going to launch into the axioms for quantum theory. So you're going to hear about Hilbert space and density operators and projectors and unitary operators. All this mathematical structure we can connect to experiment, so we know how this mathematical structure allows us to predict phenomena in the lab. But it's a very abstract formulation of the theory. I mean, these mathematical axioms you're about to see essentially fall from the sky in some sense. I mean, if you read a little bit about the history of, of this piece here, how the, um, the, founding, the founders of quantum theory developed the axioma, axiomatic formulation, it's almost embarrassing. I mean, what they did was great science, of course, Nobel winning science, but I mean, Schrodinger was just playing around with differential equations till he found one that would work. And um, Born, when he published the, the paper that, in which he introduced the Born rule, which connects the predictions of quantum theory to the probabilities observed in the lab, he had it wrong. And the correct version of the Born rule was published as a footnote. And when he realized in hindsight that the property he, he put forward as giving the probabilities of outcomes was actually a complex valued number. He said it was the wave function and then realized, no, it had to be the modulus squared. So there was almost this kind of clumsiness to the discovery of a set of mathematical principles that would give us a self-consistent theory that explained what was known and also made future predictions. Contrast that with uh, special relativity, where Einstein made this enormous leap in our knowledge by taking two physical principles, um, one of which is the speed of light is constant in all reference frames, and the other? Laws of physics are invariant under appropriate transformations, or the same in all reference frames, all initial frames. So there, thank you. So we have two physical principles. The physics should look the same no matter what your velocity is, and a kind of unexpected one, this light is, because the speed of light is predicted by electromagnetism, that that should also be, uh, the same in all reference frames, inertial reference frames. So you have these physical principles which then implied the Lorentz transformations. Notice that the Lorentz transformations of special relativity were discovered first, and then Einstein showed how those transformations were implied by a set of very natural physical principles. That, say, that unfortunately, 80 years later, is not the case for quantum mechanics. So we have this very mathematical formulation of the theory which is highly successful and enormously powerful, but we don't have a deep or consensus understanding of why the world should be that way. And so the hope is that by finding such a set of principles, which is an active subject of research here at Primer Institute and other, in other places around the world, that we will get a deeper understanding of quantum theory and that, that might help us also um, answer some of these other questions such as two here. So last but not least is the question of our understanding of ourselves in, in the reality that quantum theory gives us. So you've all, I'm sure, heard about these questions of interpretation of how to make sense of the quantum formalism uh, from a physical point of view as opposed to an operational point of view. How many of you feel like you understand that distinction, um, operational versus, say, physical? Okay, so uh, basically, Let's, let's talk about science. So what is science? So you'd like to think that we do science because we want to understand how the world works. And the same could be said of quantum theory. 
But in practice, when you look at the way science actually works, <laughs> what it, what's it driven by? It's driven by kind of the human ambition to be able to control and predict physical systems. And so quantum theory gives us that ability to control and predict physical systems. So in that sense, with the formulation of quantum theory we have now, we've succeeded at that goal. But there's this kind of deeper philosophical ambition, which is to understand what the world is like. And in my view, that part of the mystery, or that part of the motivation for science, is not fulfilled by our current understanding of quantum theory. That we don't have a clear picture of what the world is like. In fact, it's not even clear if we can ever be given one. And so that's why there's this kind of dissonance in different scientists' points of view about what quantum theory tells us about the nature of reality, because there's essentially a freedom in our ability to guess at what that is like in light of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics allows multiple interpretations, um, one or none of which may be correct. And um, this, for me, is a major incentive also to understand quantum theory from a foundational point of view. So I want to, again, emphasize the fact that from a practical point of view of controlling and predicting systems, you know, we've done that. Quantum theory does that. But this deeper question, which has a philosophical flavor to it, is still unresolved. So those are, for me, the major reasons why I became a, um, you know, a scientist who studies quantum theory. So by way of background, I should mention that so um, I basically work in two different areas, one of which is quantum information, and the other is quantum foundations. And I'll be happy to talk about that in more length, what my research is involved with. But basically, it's always kind of within the framework of quantum theory. Um, because really, I want to, I mean, it's great to do practical applications of quantum theory. But for me, these are the real driving principles for wanting to understand quantum theory as well as I can. Does anyone else want to add any motivations that I've missed? It's fun? There, that's a great one. Perfect. I'm trying to understand how the classical world of energy Yeah, for me, that's okay. That's I actually did my PhD thesis on that problem. <laughs> so I'd like to say it's more solved. Um, I think that. Um, it's a dangerous question to ask me because I could just go on for hours about that. Um, but uh, you know, you know what? I think it maybe it's worth touching on that with like a lecture later on. But in my view, the emergence of classicality from quantum theory is intimately tied with how you answer this question. And so, for some answers to this question, I think that problem is solved. For other answers to this question, that problem is still open. So I'm being very vague there. In my point of view, I think that the emergence of classicality is understood with a caveat. And maybe I can get more into that later, but there's a lot of background you need to kind of have that discussion. Um, OK, great. So now I'll just launch into the axioms. I hope I've given you enough motivation to be anxious to see a kind of formal statement of the theory. and. Um, learn any new mathematics you need to learn in order to be able to work with the theory. So our first axiom concerns itself with how do we describe physical systems. So a physical system, 
or more precisely, a preparation of a physical system So what I mean by that is um, not just the idea of some physical system, but the idea that I followed some particular set of instructions in order to prepare a system in a particular configuration. So I'm calling that a preparation procedure following the terminology of Leslie Ballantyne. Is represented by a non-negative linear operator row called a quantum state or also called a density operator And then I'm going to add an additional um, specification that states of maximal knowledge called pure states are represented by rank one projectors. where psi is a Hilbert space vector. This is redundant. So let's add this for clarity. Okay, now I expect that some of this will be new to you. So um, I have some uncertainty in my mind about whether or not I should launch into the um, launch into the second axiom and then we'll have some discussion about these new mathematical properties and their empirical significance or just start talking right away about what this terminology means. Um, let me um, let me let me do some remarks now. But just to get a flavor of where you guys are, do you want to start asking me questions about any of this terminology that's, I mean, there are probably both mathematical and physical questions here. Like, I don't know how many of you know what, what does it mean for an operator to be non-negative? Does anyone know the formal definition of that? Okay, good. I can tell you that. Um, so, remarks. Letter the use letters remarks. So remark A, a non-negative operator A uh, 
where, by the way, whenever I say operator going forward, I always mean linear operator. So let me just make the general comment that quantum theory as rich of a variety of phenomena as it predicts and as profoundly inexplicable as it is, is amazingly just linear algebra. So you all learn linear algebra in second year. You all learned a small fraction of linear algebra in your second year course or whenever you had it. Um, basically, quantum theory is nothing more than linear algebra with an interpretation. So that should kind of is meant to remove some of your intimidation at the formal structure of the theory because all you're doing is learning linear algebra. So a non-negative linear operator A satisfies So for every vector in the Hilbert space, your psi or silver Hilbert space, you should be familiar with. How many of you have seen Dirac notation where you use the, let me, sorry, let me do this. How many of you have not seen Dirac notation? Great. So this is a Hilbert space vector. H denotes the Hilbert space. Um, would one of you like to impress your, your friends and remind us quickly what a Hilbert space is? In finite dimensions, at least? So, okay, Hilbert space in finite dimensions is just an inner product space. So it's a, ve a vector space which also has an inner product defined on it. Um, a complex, in particular, a complex vector space for a complex Hilbert space. Now, in infinite dimensions, there's some subtleties involved. The vector space has to be complete in the norm, which I'll define later when we talk about infinite dimensions. So what I'd like to do first is kind of present quantum theory and its properties where I'll mainly be looking in finite dimension, the finite dimensional setting where almost all of the interesting features of quantum theory emerge anyways. And then later in the course, we'll discuss how do you recover wave mechanics by looking at infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces and spaces. And there's some, there's some pretty significant mathematical subtleties that have, you should be aware of at least that I'll discuss in that context, such as you know, necessary conditions for an inner product space to be a Hilbert space. Um, but for now, we just have essentially an inner product space. And so we have an inner product defined right here, where you can define phi just to be a psi. And this is the inner product between psi and phi, which you've all seen because you all know direct notation. And so here we're just saying that this operator gives a non-negative number under this, in this context. So that means it's non-negative. This guarantees, for example, if the operator is Hermitian, then it will have non-negative eigenvalues. So what this also tells you is that for this to be well-defined, this quantity has to be real. If this was complex, this wouldn't be a well-defined statement. The fact that it's real and the fact, the fact that this must be real actually tells us that this operator rho must be a Hermitian operator. So by specifying this non-negative, we guarantee that it's Hermitian. So another fact that you all know, by convention, we normalize quantum states. And the conventional normalization is that the trace of rho is equal to 1. Now, I can't remember if the trace was defined in those notes you showed me, Tibra, the review they had of facing. Do any of you not know what the trace of an operator is? If so, I can define it. Great. So notice that um, if we take for a pure state, which is the kind of state most of you are familiar with, one has um, rho is equal to I have a shorthand way of writing this, but so this is called an outer product where this vector is a Hilbert space vector and the bra in the braquette notation of Dirac is an element of the dual space. And um, for a pure state, this condition reduces to trace of psi psi is equal to psi psi is equal to one. 
So you recover the usual normalization condition you learned for wave mechanics. A pure state can be defined in three equivalent ways. And I'm giving you these three ways because they're useful for computational purposes. So one, you can say that rho is equal to a rank one projector. Two, you can say that um, the trace of the square of rho is equal to one. And for three, you can also just check if rho squared is equal to rho. So notice that um, because trace of rho is equal to one, that implies trace of rho squared is equal to one. This is not obvious that these two are equivalent. The fact that they're equivalent arises specifically because we're assuming rho is a non-negative operator. If we don't make that assumption, then these two aren't equivalent properties of the, of the operator. So it's a common thing to do when you're doing, uh, working on problems in quantum information is to want to check if the state you get out is pure or not. And um, these give you different ways of performing that check. Okay, so this is some mathematics. Let me give you one remark that is a um, that is a more conceptual comment. So why am I going from the usual statement of, I mean, you may have been told or learned previously that the right way to describe a physical system is by using a Hilbert space vector psi. And now I'm telling you, no, don't do that. Use this quantity rho, this, op this linear operator instead. Why, why do we make that switch? What's the practical situation which we want to account for? Exactly. So we need some way to account for imperfections or lack of ideality. I, yeah, non-maximal preparations is the problem. So the idea is um, we want to be able to describe situations where we have a mixture of preparations. So given a preparation, given a, let me give this preparation a name. Let's call it alpha. Given a preparation procedure alpha, which is some list of instructions, um, suppose we, we prepare the state, suppose we prepare the state Um, the state vector psi 1. I'm going to call it psi alpha, in fact. And given a different preparation procedure, given preparation beta, we prepare the state the state vector, so a pure state, so basically I'm using the terminology state vector as opposed to state operator to refer to a pure preparation. This is psi beta. Now suppose instead we prepare preparation alpha with some probability p alpha, and we do preparation beta with some probability p beta. So I'm just, say, flipping a coin, a biased coin, to decide which instruction set I'm going to follow. And then I'm giving you this quantum system. So you want to be able to describe what I'm giving you. How do you describe the physical system I'm giving you when you know 
that I'm flipping a coin to decide if I'm preparing if I'm using preparation alpha or preparation beta. So how do you describe that preparation? That mixed, so this is a mixed preparation. So then a mixture, by which I mean a probabilistic mixture, um, with probabilities P alpha and P beta, where P beta obviously is equal to one minus P alpha. A description of this mixed preparation, am I getting, I'm probably getting too low here. I don't know how to interpret this. <laughs> Which is the... Uh... So there's two settings where you can shuffle through. So, so these are the ones which shuffle th uh, two, and these are the ones which shuffle three. So, uh, so you, you want the... I want to send that up to the top. Okay, so front goes up top. <laughs> Always switch to complete manual. Oh, that's perfect. Oh, yeah, I always so. do that. Thank you. Oh, where was I in that sentence? Um, okay, it's too tall for me. Okay, so for that context, we assign we assign the state operator. Rho, which is equal to P alpha, Psi alpha, plus P beta, Psi beta. And then we can go on and make predictions using our next postulate, which is postulate two. Yes? Um, sure. So, um, um, so this is a, I'm calling this a rank one projector. So, okay, so what are projectors? So let me, okay, just quick, um, let me give you an aside. So let's take, we have some Hilbert space. So this is a d-dimensional complex vector space. And then we have linear operators. So this is the set of linear operators acting on the Hilbert space. These are basically matrices in some basis representation. And a, a special linear operator is called a projection operator. A projection operator, P, is a linear operator that satisfies P squared is equal to P and P adjoint is equal to P. Now I'm going to need your help when I teach this to you, this course to you guys because normally what I do with the fourth year undergrads at University of Waterloo, so I've taught this course about four times now, and normally I spend about a week reviewing basic properties of linear algebra including projection operators, dual spaces, and things like that. I suspect but don't know that for some of you this is material that you would benefit from seeing again or seeing for the first time. Is that right? Okay. I have to usually ask these questions in the negative to get answers. Who does not want to see any review of uh, dual spaces, projection <laughs> operators, 
So just a couple of you feel really comfortable with this material. Maybe half. Okay, so I'll spend some time then inserting this material as needed. And I'd like to put the onus on you guys to step up and just be courageous and say, could you remind us what that is or something like that? And I can also in the tutorials, we can defer some of this material. Um, but so a projection operator is a special linear operator, well, a particular linear operator which satisfies these two properties. And um, what this means is, in particular, if you look at this condition, so this tells us that the eigenvalues are real. This tells us that the eigenvalues have to be one or zero. So the eigenvalues, eigenvalues of any projector of P must be zero or one. So given some vector phi in the Hilbert space, P phi is either equal to phi or the null vector. So phi is an eigenstate of P, but I mean, here's the thing. All states are going to be eigenstates of P, either with eigenvalue. No, that's not right. Sorry. Sorry, that's not right. So um, let me give you further context, and I'll give it be more precise. So what this does is it divides the Hilbert space into two subspaces. So you have a subspace, a subspace of H. Any subspace of a vector space is another vector space. There's a subspace of H which has eigenvalue 1 and a subspace of H which has eigenvalue 0 for each projector. So a state which was a linear combination of some state from the first subspace and the second subspace would not be an eigenvector of P. So I, I misspoke a moment ago. Um, so we have basically what this induces is two subspaces of H. A subspace... Um, we call it V1. We call them V1 and V2. And then for every phi in V1, one has P phi is equal to phi. And for every phi in V2, which is orthogonal to V1, one has P phi is equal to zero. Now a rank one projector corresponds to a, so the point is each projector is associated to some subspace of the Hilbert space for which it just returns the state you gave it. And a rank one projector is a projector for which the subspace of eigenvalue one is a one-dimensional subspace. So what that means is a rank one projector is a projector that picks out one state in the Hilbert space as distinguished. And it turns out if that one state is psi, you can always write it in terms of this outer product. So what is this, how does that outer, outer product work? Well, if I have some vector chi in H, then we can always write chi as a linear combination, L goes from 1 to D of, um, call it AL 
phi L. So here phi L is an orthonormal basis for the Hilbert space, and A L are the expansion coefficients. So A L is equal to phi L chi. And then if one has a rank one projector P, so given P, P let's call it seven, is equal to phi seven, phi seven, then you see P seven acting on chi. It's a linear operator, so we just bring it through the sum. P7 acting on phi L. And then what this looks like is our sum, AL phi 7, phi 7, phi L. And then this, as I said earlier, but didn't write down, I'm assuming here that, where did I write it? Phi L is an orthonormal basis. So phi 7 phi L gives us a Kronecker delta function, which removes the sum. And then I guess you guys won't see this until I move it. I won't be able to move it. Um, well, I'm sure you can do this in your heads. This gives you a7 phi 7. So it picked out that one vector. Yeah. Is there a fourth? Is there a fourth blackboard? Oh, nice. All right. So but then you'll lose some of that. You can only see three at a time is the problem, right? Um, Anyways, this was just a digression. I don't know if anyone really wants to see that, I guess you can step up for a moment and take a look. So this is the mid. Now, I don't know, did that answer your question? It helped? Okay. Okay, how do I number this? Axiom one is a one, so we'll do here, axiom two. I don't know if the word postulate is more appropriate than axiom here, but replace axiom with postulate if you prefer. Um, so axiom two concerns measurement. So we've got this description of the preparations. How do we describe our measurements? So every uh, physical observable which we can think of as a measurement procedure, is represented by a Hermitian operator where the 
the set of allowed outcomes of the measurement procedure O are labeled by the eigenvalues of O, which corresponds to this set, lambda L, and B the probability of observing outcome lambda L given a preparation rho is the Born rule the probability of lambda L is equal to the trace of rho against the projector PL. And I'll just add this kind of implied, but I'll just say this for clarity, where PL is the projector onto the subspace labeled by lambda L. Okay, so first of all, why this clumsy language? Why am I talking about preparations rather than quantum states and measurement procedures? Does anybody know why I'm bothering to add this awkward language to these definitions rather than say a quantum state is a density operator and a measurement is a Hermitian operator. Yeah? Yeah, well the word, yeah, I think you're onto this. Yeah? Okay, that's a big part of it too. So. What I'm getting at here is that we have this mathematical framework and we have ways of connecting the mathematical framework to things we do in the lab. And so mainly, it's, we've done that with two. So with postulate two here, we've said, okay, well the probabilities of distinct outcomes is given by this prescription and the set of allowed outcomes is given by this prescription, which I'll describe to you in a minute. And um, <clears throat> so that's empirical. And, but the reason why I emphasize, for example, with axiom one, why I called it a preparation procedure rather than a state is because I don't want to bias your thinking about what rho is physically when I'm telling you what it is mathematically. And so one of the reasons is the following. The word state for most physicists is taken to mean something analogous to the state in classical mechanics. So if I say, if I have some classical me mechanical system with a phase space with properties Q and P, position and momenta, and I ask you what's the state of the system, you realize that the correct answer comes in the form, oh, well, its position is this and its momentum is this. That's its state. So there's a physicality to the notion of state as some properties of the object. Whereas in the point is in quantum mechanics, that's exactly the question of interpretation. Is that the correct way to think about the density operator? And the point is we don't know. And so the reason I use the term preparation procedure is to remind you that the state operator, well, even if it's a pure state, represents some procedure we perform in the lab and it's a mathematical representation of that. It's not necessarily the thing in itself. So I'm kind of 
kind of bracing you for future confusion, lots of debates, unfortunately and sadly, lots of kind of debates between people in the hallways about the interpretation of quantum mechanics. They're both using the word state to mean totally different things. One person's talking about the mathematical object, another person's talking about the physical concept. And um, unfortunately in the quantum setting, we can't connect those two without making additional assumptions. So maybe that was a bit vague, but it'll be clear in the fullness of time <laughs> why, why that's an important distinction. So first of all, so that's the warning, word of warning about why I'm using this kind of additional language. And now let's talk about some of the features of the second postulate. So uh, first of all, how many of you recognize this spectral decomposition? Okay, so almost all of you. So um, uh, a spectral decomposition is a way to decompose an operator in terms of its eigenvalues and the projectors onto the subspaces associated with those eigenvalues. Um, this might be something worth reviewing in the tutorial, I think, um, the spectral decomposition. It, it follows quite generally for operators. I think for normal operators is the broadest class. <clears throat> now, of course, because we have a Hermitian operator, you all know that the eigenvalues have to be real. And um, uh, what else do I want to add? I've, I've called these eigenvalues labels because really that's all they are. I mean, we like to think about, uh, think about an, an operator like position. Uh, you would decompose it, and the eigenvalues would be the position C numbers associated with the particle. And um, that's a physical property. But it's not always the case for arbitrary observables that the eigenvalue corresponds to some physical property. In many contexts, it's just literally a label for different sets of possible outcomes. So that's the first kind of caveat. Um, I guess I'll have to start erasing now. Let me bring motivation down. T. Brad, does this class normally stop at um, 10.20 or 10.30? Oh, so I'm already a little bit over time. Okay. Um, so maybe this would be a good stopping point. Is there anything else I absolutely want to mention? Oh, yeah, I'll just mention one thing so you can you know ponder overnight. So notice that I have a, a component A and a component B to this measurement postulate. As I mentioned earlier, the Born rule which is property B here, is um, it assigns the statistical likelihood of observing a certain outcome given a given preparation procedure. This is the statistical aspect of quantum mechanics, which actually came later. The first part of this is a structural aspect. So when you think about kind of an interesting way to think about quantum mechanics is that it broadly has two different features. One is structural and the other is statistical. So one of the big successes of quantum mechanics in the 20s was the fact that they could use it to predict the spectrum of the atom. For example, the hydrogen atom or any other atom for that matter. So what does that mean, predicting the spectrum? It means specifying the allowed energy levels of the atom and discovering that they were discrete. So here we have a discrete sum. And here the lambda Ls, if the, if the observable O was the energy of the hydrogen atom, we would have a discrete set of allowed energies. And then, of course, the observed spectroscopy of the Balmer series and so on is the differences between these energy levels, which corresponds to the emitted radiation. So this is a structural prediction of quantum mechanics based on essentially the non-commutative algebra associated with quantum mechanics. And it predicts a discrete spectrum, for example, for the black body case of Planck. And it, of course, describes the atom and solves the question of Rutherford's model and its instability. And then in addition to that, quantum mechanics also makes predictions about, given some way of preparing the atom or of preparing the oven, how do you, what is the likelihood of observing these different, of these different allowed states? 
And that's essentially a, a separate piece of quantum mechanics which is given, was discovered by Born, and it says that we can determine the probability or the statistical likelihood of that outcome using this rule, which depends, of course, on how the system was prepared and the nature of the observation you're making. Um, so next class, we will discuss uh, the third postulate, which is transformation. So how do we get the Schrodinger equation out of quantum mechanics? Or you know, basically postulate the Schrodinger equation, but in a slightly different form. And then we will also move on to discuss composite systems and entanglement and things like that. Yes? Yeah, so no. I mean, if you look at Asher Perez has a textbook on quantum mechanics, which is one of my favorites. It'll be in your list called Concepts and Methods. And he writes down some 20, some 20 axioms, um, which includes all this other background information. When you write down quantum mechanics just as a formal statement with three or four axioms, you're implicitly, uh, you're implicitly kind of requiring the user of the theory to be able to figure out how do I associate some given preparation procedure with a given density operator? How do I associate some measurement procedure with a particular Hermitian operator? And so that is part of a whole calibration process which the experimentalist has to go through to figure out what they're actually doing. And the idea is the quantum theory says, well, you should be able to find some Hermitian operator to explain the measurement you're doing. And you should be able to find some density operator to describe the preparation you're doing. But it's up to you to figure out which, which of those objects, which mathematical object is associated with, with particular different methods of preparation. In fact, in quantum information, where people control, where we try to theoretically describe how experimentalists go about controlling individual systems with high precision, one of the big challenges any experimentalist has to face is this problem of quantum tomography or state tomography. And there, the idea of state tomography is very much the idea that you um, have some unknown preparation procedure, by which you mean you know what you did, but you don't know what density operator to assign to that instruction set. And there's a specific procedure you follow to uh, parameterize the density operator and find the correct description of that preparation. So yeah, that's left out of the axioms. That's more part of the background information you need to apply the theory. Thanks for that question. So thanks for your attention, and I'll see you tomorrow morning.